We're live. <laughs> after 12 years. No, I'm just kidding. Not 12 years. Um, <laughs> after Kim made several mistakes with our flyer. Like, can y'all believe it? <laughs> just mistake after mistake on Beyonce's internet, no less. Wow. <laughs> Had y'all read it like uh... the mannequins. Had you <laughs> night of the mannequin. No, I'm just kidding. It was me. I uh, was the culprit. It was me. Um, today it, it was talk- it was funny huh? because because we did. There, oh, oh, sorry, y'all, but um, we did talk about doing that book next. But then we're like, should we just vote on it? Should we just yeah. ask the people what they want? Next. Ask the folks what they want, and then <laughs> somehow I disappointed us. I think also in our last our last time we met, this train is really loud, so I apologize for that. But I think the last time we met, I was also in the car. Were we? Were I feel like I was in the car. <laughs> you might have been. I feel I feel like that is um, very much true. Okay, um, yeah. So we are here to talk about mapping the interior. And um, that is the lovely book. I did, however, buy the audio book. So I'll show that too. I bought the audio book for $5 because I didn't have time to physically read it. So that's that. And this is my first time trying the book app on the iPhone. Not bad. Not bad. They got audio books. What, what app was that? The book app on the audio phone. I mean, oh. on the on the on the uh, what is it called? On the iPhone. Oh, but so like, iBooks? Yeah, I didn't know they had like audio books and, and such things. <coughs> but they they have audio books, I think, through Amazon Audible, but they're like a dollar or two cheaper on books that's already programmed in your iPhone if you already have it. So that's what yeah, I have I, going on. I used to have a, a iPhone um, and I would buy iBooks on there. And then Oh, you did I too? I, yeah, I used to buy books on there, but now I don't because I don't have an iPhone anymore. <laughs> but um, I have a, a laptop, uh, Apple. So sometimes like I'll go back into my old books and I'll just scroll through and see like what I used to read. It's fun, but yeah, some of their books are pretty cheap. They'll have yeah. sales too. Yeah. Um, Jessica comes from <laughs> life on Beyonce's internet, huh? Not the audio phone, Bree. That's what I thought it was audio phone. How old am I? 87. 87. I will be 88 next week. Why they say black don't crack? I know, I know. It's should, we, should we winding it? <laughs> <laughs> Turn back the hands of time. Um, not my genre, but you're my people, so I'm here. Actually, I didn't think hey. this book was that scary. It, it had some some cre- creepy factors, but. Yeah. And some a little bit of gore, but it wasn't. This is like definitely a blend of like weird fiction, right? And then yeah. cultural pieces, lit fic, like if you're talking about native communities, and a um, little bit of horror. Yeah. So it was is interesting read, and it's such a fast read. It was like, such a fast read. Okay, um, I'm going to be honest here on Beyonce's internet. Oftentimes, I be wanting um, Kim to describe the book. Because <laughs> be like, uh, what did I just read? And the way you synthesize things is just so much better than me. But I'm going to do it today to not put that pressure on you. Well, actually, remember you did it last time. Over, I did? Yeah, I think so. And then remember, your I turn. said, all right. Yeah, because I was like, bring your guest to my show, so I'm going to put you on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, and I, right. I just threw it back at you. Okay, okay wow. so. It is now <laughs> Kim's turn. <laughs> okay, for our next book, for, uh, was it Z- 
zombie sharks have metal teeth? You can you can do the synopsis for that one. That be fun uh, the of the zombie shark teeth. You want me to do that? Yeah, you can do that okay. synopsis. All right. Okay, so mapping the interior. Um, I would. It's a short book. Um, people would say it was a novella, but it's packed. There's so much going on in these pages. I think, especially if you're reading from an emotional standpoint, cultural, and then there's elements layered of horror um, in there. And I, I would say that definitely. Uh, okay, but anyway, let me go through. <laughs> so it takes place. There's this, it says on the synopsis a 15 year old kid, but when you first start. The, the, the kid is actually 12 and he transitions into being 13 and then but it's actually not told in a present time I think he's older like how he is at the end of the book and then he's kind of reflecting back on what he remembers had happened but, exactly um, yeah so he's a native kid with a native family his mom and then his little brother they left the reservation uh, to city life, I imagine, like an urban, it seems like an urban community. And it's just them. Like, and the way he talks about how, uh, yeah, when you leave the res, you leave the res, but you don't really leave poverty, right? <laughs> so him talking about that, but then also during all that, he remembers that he's seen like the ghost of his dead father and then he starts working his way through that experience all the way till when he's an older man at the end of the book. Um, so I hope that's not too spoilery, but, and yeah, so we'll just, so I guess we'll be non-spoiler right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. When do you want me to do the synopsis of Zombie Shark at the end or right now? Uh, well, we can do that in August. I'm really doing that one. No, I was saying the synopsis. Like, I was going to read the synopsis of the book. Oh, for our next read? Yeah. Do you want to do it at the end? Okay. Oh, yeah, we could do it at the end. Because that's our... Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, speaking of non-spoiler, I don't have a nail, but I'm going to tell you how to mind y'all business. Okay? <laughs> not worry about these things. Okay. So, um... I'm not going to lie, the timeline in the beginning of the book um, threw me off, but that is a consistent feeling I have with Stephen, Stephen Graham Jones' books. Even though I love them, I don't fully get the picture until we're almost halfway through and to the end. It's like N.K. Jemison with me, but I'm not mad at that. You know what I mean? Like, you just was like, it went from um, the res, and then, like, I didn't pick up any of that, and it usually takes me some time. But I'm, I'm not mad that that is what happened. Um, I think it really started getting interesting <laughs> to me when his subconscious, where, where I felt that he felt his subconscious was playing a game on him on whether he was seeing his dad or not. That's when I started yeah. to recall. I mean, what was going you on. definitely get like elements of, I mean, he's, he's definitely an unreliable narrator. You're just like, I don't trust this kid. You don't know if if um, he's really experiencing what he's experiencing or if it's just grief getting the best of him. But I think what I enjoyed a lot about this book is that real, what Stephen Graham Jones does, right? He, he writes very literary. Yeah. And a lot of people don't like that because his prose is very, he very much tries to get into the mind of the person that he's talking about or the people yeah and so sometimes you're like wait that doesn't make sense but if you were to hear people talk on the res like it's, it makes it's sense. a lot of it makes sense there's a lot of slang cutting off sentences and then starting another thought and then him thinking things through stream of consciousness so it, it i think maybe if you don't understand a lot about native cultures communities and history you're going to be like, what the heck is this person saying? But also, uh, within this book, it's really amazing how Stephen uh, goes back and forth between Native contemporary life 
to like horror element <laughs> yeah. and to like, wait, is this really happening? So especially- um, And also like think, some traditional well, elements. Yeah, yeah the, like traditional cultural elements. Like, so when I first read Togi, right? Um, the Only Good Indians, I was like, okay, I need to read. Cause that was like the first time I saw like native culture representative within the horror genre. Usually I just, it, 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 I didn't find anything before that. So as soon as I read that, I read this and mm -hmm. I was like, my brain is <laughs> melting. Like when I finish this book, cause it's just so deeply like absorbing or absorbed in sorrow and so lost much. potential and, mm -hmm. and just heartbreak and mm -hmm. um and a lot of people may it's kind of like that um kind of like with uh living dead in texas the very real realities of life can be just as horrifying than horror itself so i found that within this book but yeah it also crosses over into that horror realm too so go ahead uh Bri, I'll, I'll throw it back at you no i was um so while reading uh mapping the interior i kept thinking like man there is there is a consistent theme in Stephen graham jones work of uh loss and grief and like moving through that and trying to move through that in a contemporary way like you said earlier while also like trying to keep um traditions intact and one of the lines like about his mom and like my mom would have been alive longer if she had community if the people who didn't move away like she could have spoken to or or talked to about her troubles and the impact on this book hit me in a lot of ways um similar to that book the deep have, have you read the deep yes loved um, it by river solemn yeah so i i feel like there were some similar themes of like it might be short but it packs a good punch you know kind of thing um i also wanted to say like another thing i like about stephen graham jones characters is that there was a how do i say it there is a specific type of reflection that happens within his characters within themselves that i always find just nice <laughs> to know like like for so for example in this book the main character um the guy that uh kim talked about earlier who's turning 13 we're we think that we're getting this from his perspective but he's like telling us what he thinks he recall what happened in the story and uh there was a moment where he was like i think my dad is like got a hold on my brother like i think something is happening but it could have happened before but i wouldn't have known because that was like before my reflection of noticing when my brother started to change and that just that reflective piece was very important to me because it, it shows that like you are thinking of multiple angles of this situation like you are thinking that there could have been something that happened before that you didn't see like you are considering multiple different ways before you act and and did and did what he ultimately did so it's that reflective piece that i see in most of his characters that i really appreciate and i always feel like there is no like time frame on this reflectiveness his characters can be a child or a 75 year old man and still have that reflective elements in each book that i've read that he has written yeah and i feel like that reflective thesis is so important especially for indigenous communities like um, it's almost like you can't move on to that next stage of uh, young adult, adulthood adult, without truly looking back at what, what you've gone through. And sometimes I think that when we see the sorrowfulness and, and the despondence in his writing is sometimes 
they may have not changed or mm. grown all that much or they're maybe possibly repeating like not necessarily a curse but this cycle within their families yes yeah. and then then you kind of parallel that over to intergenerational trauma or violence or, or whatever it's kind of like you're you're not really running away from something but i think at the end of this book i i was just like i thought of all of those i should have done this i could have done this or i should have done it this way you know yeah and i think within indigenous communities if, especially he he writes it so well where he's not trying to be this stereotype where he's saying yeah we're traditional we live this way for the, the the life ways that we have but instead you see it from that other side where when when um like when they moved away from the reservation you see it within junior you see it that disconnection that not understanding where he's from or what happens or um or even a way like with indigenous communities there is a way to handle grief and to move on and uh, as far as like my own so i i saw that in this book and when you're disconnected from those things and, and that's what the horror element comes in he's, yeah he's bad things happening and yeah. he's trying to make sense of it right he's trying mm -hmm. to make sense of this, this this horror that's happening but with the kid who's who's grieving for his dad and all all of a sudden he's seeing him and he, right away he's like oh dad's here to help dino yeah he's here to help my brother because he's so yeah. hopeful he's yearning for a father figure because remember his mom says that like I yeah think kids your age they're learning for a father figure and mm -hmm. so he's he's like oh like why so he looks at this this entity this dad and he's excited about it he's happy until these things <laughs> are happening and uh i don't know um so do we want to say where we rated this book and then we'll jump into spoilers yeah um i i'm anywhere between a four and a five but i already put a four online <laughs> i mean i already put a five online <laughs> i already put the five online yeah yeah i couldn't remember where i rated this at i think because i was just comparing it to like togi and i was like yeah. was it? it's not five because i gave Toki a five because it just gave me everything and yeah. i think for like how short this is for a novella and and honestly like i want to say this book isn't going to be for everyone because the narrative and the prose is so elusive and it's purposeful that way yeah um, it's also that's how um, i felt the book it, before yeah that. And, and the writing is intended to reflect confusion, the unreliable narrator. And then also, if you don't like, um, like, if you don't, I know some horror, they just give it to you, right? They give you, they give it all to you. They explain every single thing. But of course, when you're this young kid, and then all of a sudden, you don't understand what you've gone through, and then you're yeah. a grown up, you still don't understand, then yeah, you're going to have you're not going to have questions answered because the, the person themselves don't even know it so yeah. i feel like i feel like um so that's so if you guys don't like those kind of reads then this probably isn't going to be for you but i think i gave this a five i i remember yeah. i think i gave it a five i mean even if i had it i think the reread was still really amazing for myself so i gave it a five yeah i think it's important like to talk about that there are different types of horror right and like the horror that people are used to that includes like gore dismemberment you know all those different things um it's different when you're talking about different communities of people like for me throughout the book what i felt because i was in earlier that it didn't like feel scary to me in the sense of like reading a how, how do i i'm trying to think of another horror writer like um this the japanese horror writers i read like their horror the way they write it is different than the way this guy yeah. does it um but what i found scary as hell which can also and not can is also horror is every time he uh, made a statement about that link of like losing that connection to culture 
when he would be like, yeah, in the old ways they did this, but that's not here anymore. Like, I just felt so much sadness from that. Even when he was like, you know, traditionally you're supposed to get your um, regalia like through, um, yeah, uh, piece by say, piece. ceremony and piece by piece. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yep, that's not what happened to me. Or it was like, this type of healing with his mom could have happened this way. And he's like, we don't do that anymore. So like the loss of culture to me um, and the loss of connection is it's just horrific because you you know how it happened and you know why it's a side effect of X. And we don't have to go into deep about X, but it just was really sad um, to hear that. And then it was also really sad seeing this kid who really wants a father, like you said earlier, and, you know, grasping for whatever that can make them, or give them comfort. And like, even thinking about like, oh, if my father was here, you know, this, this, and this would have happened, or we don't know what would have happened to him. And even people that um, he lost would be in like, you know, I don't know what would have happened to this person and that person. It's just the consistent loss in whatever form it was in was very sad. <laughs> Sorry. Was very oh, sad. Bless you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I think what, you know how sometimes some of the horror reads you I read, get that huge impact, like in the middle of the book, like at its climax, right? Yeah. And, but for me, it was at the end. I was like, where's the rest of the, <laughs> where's the rest of the story? Cause, and I was like, Did he, is he doing what I think he's doing? And, and wow, I was just like, okay. So I guess we'll get into spoilers now, right? Yeah. All right. So mapping the interior, if y'all haven't read this, I suggest you check it out. It's, it's like recent, I think I read this in one sitting. It took me maybe an hour, something like that. And, yeah, um, but gosh, I don't remember. The audio book is coming. two hours. Audio book's two hours, yeah. And it, it's really short, but um, I think there are there might be times where you do have to backtrack a little bit. And I think it's just like what Brie was saying. It's 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 also like a traditional cultural read in some sections. So, and it's it's interesting because he, it's this boy who's trying to make sense of things and. If he doesn't, then we aren't either. So unless you're like from that community and you understand what he's trying to work through, but it, it was it was good. But okay, Bree, what is like? What was your most like? Like two favorite moments from this book? Um, or your your two most horrific moments from this book? I'll put. Oh, I'll be, uh, well, I have a favorite. Um. And like, just help me if my understanding was, was not right. <laughs> so specifically with Dino at the end, when, you know, brother was like, look, we about to head out. I think it was a moment of him unaliving, right? Like him dying. I, I think, yeah, like he's kind of right. like, like Junior's offering up his brother. Exactly. He's so, talking about like, yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah. That moment felt really healing to me. <laughs> like the ceremony and him doing that felt very healing to me. Um, and I, I caught I caught myself having to pause the book, and then I came back to it a couple hours later. But that was one of the most like uh, I guess memories of the book that stuck to me the most. Um, Another part is when the mom was telling him, like, you know, I shouldn't have stayed with your father. Like, I knew that there was something bad about him. And then it went into about, like, how you are as a human being follows you when you're no longer mm -hmm. in physical form. Um, mm -hmm. So those two moments uh, was, well, the first one was healing to me. That was scary because I was like, shit, and just thinking about like energy, transference, and like stuff still being there, that scared the shit out of me. Cause I was like, wow, like how, how do you cleanse an area 
or how do you fix that? Not saying that everything has to be fixed because we also yeah. have to be balance. But yeah. I was just like, how do you how do you get past that? I can't even think of a, a solution to that because it just scared the shit out of me and made me want to be like, you know what? I I just need to do right. <laughs> you know, I gotta do right right now. I have to, you know, just do shit in a good way because um I don't want no issues, no problems, none of that. And I don't want to give my family members who are still living any issues. So it, it really scared the shit out of me and put me in a deep reflective point of view. Yeah, it's man, that ending. I was like, uh <laughs> Yeah. I just left yeah. it so sad. It I know it, like I think I even dreamt about it like yeah <laughs> something because i don't know but um i think one of my moments for me was okay so if y'all don't know if you haven't read this part but when he first sees his dad and he's this ghost person mm-hmm. he's dressed up as a fancy dancer and i don't know if you guys ever seen what a fancy dancer looks like you can actually see part of it on on, on the cover of his book but yeah, there you have like this huge headdress of quills. Mm. I think, oh no, it's a mohawk, right in the mm-hmm. middle. And then I think yeah. you have one it's feather, two feather. Yeah, yeah, based yeah. on based on what community you're from. Then you, they usually have like a medallion right here. Then it goes mm. beaded all the way around. Um, yeah, and they have these huge bustles like popping out the back. Huge it's bustles like, in the back. Yeah, in the front, they're like on their big. arms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's and when they dance, it's really fast, and it's beautiful. And then when when you hear him, that's this is the thing that got me was like when you hear them walking and they're not even dancing, they're noisy, right? You can, they you can hear them so way noisy. over there, and yeah, yeah. So when he first sees him, and he says there was no noise, but I I knew all the stuff he was wearing, he, all that stuff is noisy, but to not hear it and then you see it and you're like what yeah <laughs> and then was, and yeah. yeah and then to the end right where where he 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 um basically he kills his dad right and they're back at the kitchen like they almost do this interesting time leap or this i don't i couldn't tell if it was a time leap or a spiritual leap into the next world but i it wasn't very descriptive mm-hmm. but when they come back to his kitchen and the dogs start tearing that dad apart. And usually all these things you tie on me, they're all laced and all different kinds of whatever. But those things are part of him. <laughs> He's like getting ripped and shattered apart. Yeah. And it, it was such this, this scary moment for me because when you see those dances, especially when at powwows, those are supposed to be like dances of healing and bringing community together and and happiness and those types of things. But then to see it like in a horror book, it honestly (laughs) scared the crap out of me. And I was like, oh my goodness. I won't lie. When I was thinking of that scene, I was like, what if this was like a woman in a jingle dress? Like, holy (laughs) shit. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, I would have passed out. Like, immediately. (laughs) Immediately, I would have been scared. Just on site. (laughs) And I also want to point out, I prefer women's fancy, but I get it. You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) I was just like, oh, man. (laughs) How he connects, like, different cultural aspects and make it horror. Genius. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love that. I think another, I think Jessica, yeah, Jessica was talking about the dogs underneath the trailer Let me so see okay oh man i can't remember okay. who did a live a live show on this book was it pastel rights i i don't, I don't remember well maybe she was they were uh maybe they were a speaker but i don't know but i went on that that um live show for a little bit and they were talking about how how the how stephen graham jones makes everyday elements um horrifying and he talked about the dog and and they were saying oh i love my dog and all this stuff but you know what i wasn't thinking that when i was reading that part 
I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking about, oh, sometimes res dogs roam free. They're not in a fence and they're mean. They're so mean. And like me and my uh, my spouse were talking the other day in a community, a little girl, or maybe she was older. She's a young woman. She was, they were running for their puberty ceremony and they got attacked by dogs and they died because um, part of the, yeah, part of the ceremony is to run towards the sun coming up. Yeah. And they got attacked by dogs and, or one dog maybe, but it was so sad. And so I, I saw, I see how maybe one community can see dogs where, oh, they're so nice. They're trained. You can pet them. <laughs> and then in, like when I grew up, like we used to run away from them because they're like, they were wild. Nobody owned them. And then, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Indian community, native community may not have the resources to to have like animal control or whatever. So you just see dogs like it was it was um it was like common practice for me to walk around with a big piece of wood mm -hmm. <laughs> like, going to my cousin's house. Because you, you don't know. I mean some yeah. Be yeah. And sometimes and sometimes they would just stay at the house and just bark at you, right? Mm -hmm. But others no. They like run up to you, they'll try to eat you and all kinds of stuff. But yeah, so uh, that was like where where the uh the ghost dad comes out and tears apart all the dogs i was like i had to put the book down i think the first time i read it i was like whoa <laughs> I yeah got scared at that part i was like oh my gosh yeah what were your thoughts on towards the end if not the end i'm trying to think of the timeline of him uh talking about his mom smoking oh yeah um like the part where she was um like he understands why she smokes because mm -hmm. she has like it was a way of kind of controlling yeah what was going on or whatever yeah that was i think when i i don't know if i even marked that part i might have yeah like he understood why his mom smoked that it was kind of like her way of controlling what was going on that it might have been like this tiniest thing that that she could control and um but i remember it's really close to what you were talking about earlier how like i don't i should have left your dad you know and and okay so this is how i made sense of it and it kind of goes back to that thing of like of like lost potential or mm -hmm. or not or the or the this sorrow you get when you don't meet potential and i remember in the beginning of the book it talks about his dad being this fancy dancer yeah and to be a fancy dancer it's I, I i don't know i don't i'm not into powwow culture but i can understand it's it's a very hard physical act and like he was saying you get you these, can't um, smoke yeah you have to also like um have someone mentor you through that process and then that includes like teaching you what those dances mean and what each motion and action and i'm guessing when you're doing the whole thing it's all prayer right so his dad um and then just him talking about him watching those dancers right like that was something that he didn't achieve but then to see him <laughs> as this ghost fancy dancer and like using the, the son, like what Jessica said, like uh, he saw dad over Dino and was kind of almost sucking life out of him mm -hmm. in order for him to become this this livable thing. Mm -hmm. And and like you said, like what you were in your life, it almost like transfers over like in your next life. And, and to see that and then to see that that jump into junior where mm -hmm. junior like, Remember, he says, I'm never going to leave my kid. I'm going to be the best dad. I'm going to be there for my kid. But then again, right, he he gets a girl pregnant. I think he says in a powwow. At the powwow. Yeah. Like, everything's it, coming back. Everything. Yeah. And it, it's yeah. kind of coming back around to, to him. And then he, 
he wasn't even there, right? When his when his son dies, I think they said that his it's possibly his son could have been drinking, and there's a rollover, right? And that's how his yeah. son passes away. So it's kind of like these this really interesting cycle, jumping into the next generation of like, but he becomes this fancy dancer, right? He he kind of breaks it there in a way, but it's almost like he takes the shortcut to do it. But at the same time, he fails in the one thing that he wanted most to be, which was a good dad. So it's kind of like he tries to come back to culture and, and live life that way. But then at the same time, Native communities, the center of Native communities is kinship. It's, it's family, it's connection. So he just like, it just blew past him. And then yeah. at the end, when he's talking about his son and he's, doing whatever it is that he's doing and it's just so sad and it's like if you were given that second chance like would you take it and i'm like yeah it, that, I mean, that part was the horrific part it yeah. felt almost pet cemetery-ish and yeah i haven't after read I was pet cemetery but i've heard yeah <laughs> i just mm -hmm. watched the movie i haven't read pet cemetery either, yeah. but it felt that way and i was just like man this book just kind of broke my brain <laughs> yeah it, there was like, also a, there was also a part that just in my mind and i was just like i just kept thinking man the grief and also the healing when he was like yeah my son died i won't say his name right now like that's not the time to say it and then in ceremony he says his name and then i was just like but I was just, cause I know some, I know there, like where I'm at, there's some uh, indigenous cultures where there's a reason why you don't say their name and it depends yeah. on how long they've been yeah. gone. And if you say their name, you say it a specific way. So I was thinking about like those people who've told me some of those teachings and just the way that he worded that just made me really sad. Yeah, it's the same for us too. Like, we don't. Um, it's really interesting because we're we're born, we're given a name by our paternal side or aunt, and then when you get initiated into the next thing, you're given your, your hair wash is just like you were a baby. Your hair wash again, they give you another name, mm -hmm. and then um, if you go into all these societies, you're given another name, and it's kind of like you progressing through life. So mm -hmm. when you die, that's th th the same thing happens. And that's what you don't you don't say the previous name anymore because that's not who you are anymore. You know, you're you're going into this next world and that's who you are now. That's the, the name carry. So it was it and I know with other indigenous cultures they um like they'll even say uh like I don't know if it's a verb or a noun or before they say that, that meaning like not there or something like that. Um, yeah, and it's I, and the I same up here. Don't even, yeah, and I know cultures who don't even mention them anymore. They're just, yeah, like they kind of almost use pronouns like them or they or or you remember. I mean, they know who you're talking about, but you just don't say the name anymore. So it's yeah to see just those little bit of like kind of elements sprinkled out throughout this book. It was just, and then and then to have like a layer of horror <laughs> added to it, it was just like. I think it's really Ooh, like yeah. again the sadness that just really got you being like shit this is literally terrifying and like going back to the name I also found myself getting a little choked up <laughs> just a little bit um, because when I was uh, I may have already said this but when I was in um, a sophomore in college I had a friend um, she was indigenous and I, I won't say uh, much stuff about that, but she died in the middle of the night um, in, a, in a terrible way. And uh, I just came home the next day and like the chancellor was in my apartment and was like, yo, we gotta like tell you what happened to your roommate. Um, and she died and um, at her funeral and like different ceremonies, her, her parents and her family invited me to them and just like the way they told me, like I couldn't say her name, um, I couldn't cry over her body. There's just things they told me 
that I had to act accordingly when I put the tobacco down. I couldn't turn around because that would mm-hmm. and that would let her know that I want her to come hang out with me um, mm-hmm. or that she needs to stay here with me. It was just so many different things. And I just remembered that grief, like that that um, initial feeling of, I don't know why I'm getting choked up, sorry. Just that grief of like losing a friend, you know, like, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And there's and it's really interesting because there's a way like for us to like how we grieve and how that all plays out and mm-hmm. um there's different ways like I don't know it but that last night that they're there it's just like everybody wails because after this we can't cry for them no more because yeah we have to go on a journey we don't want them to turn around to hear us you know. Yeah. So when that last time they go out, it's like so loud. It's like this keening, and um, but it's it's interesting that um, with this, that's why I saw these little things like with with Junior, um, like did he experience all of that traditional forms of grieving or what not to do in order to call back like that that person, you know? Yeah. And. And I, I saw those things like they were almost kind of like like teachable moments and well not really teachable moments but almost like um, uh, one of the things people saw like I, I saw in the reviews they're saying this book is horrible because there's no foreshadowing <laughs> there's no you don't know what's gonna happen next and I think it's just because they they're not understanding not the, the cultural context yeah yeah and and they're not completely understanding like because it's a different culture. Um, and maybe this book wasn't written for you. So that's the biggest piece of I think I think readers really really need to ask themselves when they open a book, was this book meant for you? And if there were some things you didn't understand, like just say that. You shouldn't have to be it's really rude to say, because I didn't get this cultural thing that people are living and breathing and practicing that then the book is trash like i just mm-hmm. I don't yeah i because i I've, I've read books like that where there's just think, things flying over my head but um like some of those were the deep but things that i did understand and that i i uh, in in some small way because i'm indigenous connected to um or a little bit understood on on the level of like colonialism and and um oppression was like so powerful mm-hmm. but and then when i was talking i was like I, I could see things flying over my head i could see things that i didn't understand but that doesn't make it any less of <laughs> an incredible read because yeah um, which it was i think the deep just yeah i love that book. yeah it's it's one of those things where i wish um people wouldn't jump to conclusions like it kind of remind me of something so a couple of weeks ago, I was in a training. I'm a therapist. Everyone knows that. I was in a training and someone was saying how um, this white woman was uh, with this. Um, I can't remember where where I heard it, but someone was like, this white woman was seeing this black client in this um, like facility or psychiatric facility. And the black client did like this. And the white client was like, we need to get her a psyche valve. She has to stay here in a 72 hour hold. Like something is seriously wrong with her. She's acting erratic. There is something going down. Like it was a whole situation of why this facility ran by white people justified institutionalizing a black woman because she pat her hair. And mm-hmm. if anyone don't know that, we pat our hair if we have a protective style don't have a protective style most people would like to do it because you don't want to rip you know your scalp and your hair off so it's it's relief of an itch and this Mm -hmm. fucking facility lost it so today in the meeting i'm talking to people and i go like this and literally this white woman looked at me and was like oh my god are you okay like is there something we need to do and I was like, oh, oh my Lord. God, like it's just not understanding 
<laughs> and just jumping to conclusions and being like, okay, I see this and that is that. Like I read this book and because I didn't understand it, it's trash and I'm just going to run with it. It's just like not even taking a step of being like, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And then I think too, understanding like how an author's writing style will go miles. Like I know some authors are just so detail oriented in world building. And I was like, uh, that's not the kind of stuff I enjoy all that much. <laughs> so I was like, maybe that's that author's not for me. Or a stream of consciousness. Like I know people who cannot read stream of consciousness. They're just like, nope. Like I read it, but I it's just not for me. Um, yeah. Other people that can't read like um what is it uh third point of view they just can't connect to it and then um so i think it just and but when you read stephen graham jones he definitely includes social commentary um his prose is literary but it's also he he's not gonna tell you the answer right away he's not gonna no. throw up, he's not gonna foreshadow nothing he may even jump perspectives first person the second <laughs> he he kind of keeps you on your toes and and his um, metaphors and, always make you question the person that's like point of view is from like always yeah. i feel like i'm like where did that yeah. come from and i'm like now you're making me feel like i don't trust my own narrative like while reading this <laughs> like i don't even trust what i'm thinking what you're saying you know so i'm like oh yeah <laughs> love it here though love it here yeah and then he 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 tries new things like um i think with this i feel like it it's like this interesting blend of like is he dreaming is he is he just scaring himself to the point where he's seeing things or is this really happening and and he at the end of the book they don't tell you right it's kind of like almost left for you and and like you said based on your cultural experiences to see where you end up by the end of this book and sometimes i know people who just adore really weird reads where like really <laughs> weird books so if you love weird reads this is definitely one for you because it it it, it, it just kind of jumps there's not um the transitions are sometimes they could be a little bit rough but you don't realize, like, at the, at the very beginning, he is, like, he's using past tense. I saw, like, I was I was 12 the first time I saw my dead father across from the kitchen doorway to the hall that led back to the utility room. So I think he, and then all of a sudden you realize, like, wait, something shifted here in this narrative. And sometimes he'll jump back to present. And you don't, yeah. like, oh, okay. So I think. And he's not going to tell you that either. No, which is the definition of mapping the interior. There are so many lines throughout the book that you're like, wow, you really did that. <laughs> you, were, you really <laughs> did that. You you gave us what we wanted. We're I also that. mapping the interior. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. And, I mean, yeah, because you see him mapping the interior of his home because he's trying to find evidence of his dad, right, being there. And then not only that but you're you're in junior's head too it's like you're you're mapping the interior of his grief of his understanding of this world of him being an indigenous person in contemporary life and and also there's racism there and then there's also all these other things happening like with his brother on the bus and these kids and and, and his mom honestly, like potentially his mom yeah, yeah losing her job and poverty and being like you know and it's also i mean shout out to mom i think she did the best she could with what she had honestly she did the best she could yeah. i mean she's raising two boys by herself Oof. yeah and it was it was um and you hear that in him like he's not hating her he's like he understands that too like she's trying to She's trying to be there for us. I like when he's when when um like you already know by on his based on the writing that their mom would 
go to bat for them. Mm -hmm. And she does. But she's also put in this really hard position where it's just her. And they don't have money. They yep. are, yeah. Yeah. It's, it also makes me sad when, like, uh, how, how do I say it? Like, it makes me sad when I see moms like this, like, doing the best they can. And then social services get called on them. And then they got more shit to go through and go through the system and have to, like, their jobs are going to be at jeopardy. Because with social, um, with social services, oftentimes you have to move on their dime. They're not really making yeah. a lot of accommodations for you most times um, as a person who's had family members go through that system. And it's like... If I'm a single mom and I'm already trying to pay bills and show y'all that I have the capability according to your standards of what capability looks like to take care of my children, y'all really got me in a rabbit race running around. Yeah. Like it's just, it's always sad to me because it's like, like anybody can justify taking a child from the house, it feels like, especially yeah, when we it's, think it's, about historical things related to indigenous and black folks you know so mm -hmm. it's it's just one of those sad it's things it's definitely like a system and that's institutionalized deficit based ideals you don't have this you don't have this instead of focusing on what they do have and what they need um i mean those whole like even with the indian child Welf welfare act now and it being attacked and I mean, there is a reason why we want Native kids with Native families. Culture, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma. like, And because at the end of the day, when they grow up, they're going to want to know where they're from. Yeah. They're going to want, there's something missing there. And yeah, they're, they're going to want to know. Yeah, so it's kind of like some people, uh, some communities don't understand that. Um, and it and it's that way because native kids were pulled away so many times through genocide one through um residential boarding schools right and then the indian adoption era it's just been wave upon wave of taking kids away from their mothers and from their families but you're also taking them away from a community that is raising them yeah. um I, I think there's there's there are choices that junior's mom had to make in order to remove herself from remember because she says yeah like our aunt would watch us or our uncle all these things but she made that decision based upon just her experiences but at the same time like um there's no there, 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 there's these systems that exist where they focus on what mothers or parents don't have rather yeah. than saying what are what do you what do you have what are your strengths and what do you need like how can and neglect you yeah and neglecting mm -hmm. to realize that like oftentimes when we talk about by folks individuals it's not one person raising you <laughs> like it's a whole gang of mugs you know what I mean? like i was raised by my mama my sisters my uncles my friends you know the neighbor you know, my teacher taking me home and feeding me and then be like, hey, Sheila, come pick up. You know, my <laughs> come get me. So it's like they were gangs. My grandma sisters, my grandma has 12 or I think 12 brothers and sisters. Them grabbing your girl by the coattail. So <laughs> for me, it was a gang of mugs in the raising of Bree. So like to put all that pressure on that one mom it's just ridiculous not thinking about the resources she has available to her because yeah, i don't know I one black person in my life in my community who can say single-handedly one person raised them yeah and, and i think that's why it's important to when we're talking about urban, urban native communities like we just find each other <laughs> we're just like hey where do you live at you know uh, and I feel who's like that mom? when you, yeah, like who's your mom? Where are you from? I feel like you make community that way, also like away from home, and that's why you have all the 
the creation and development of all these urban native centers, right? Like yeah. I think Minnesota, they have um, many. Um, many. Man, I'm yeah. I'm really proud of Minnesota and the in one thing. So like there's a community called Red Leg and they are doing the Lord's work with making sure indigenous babies are staying with indigenous folks. And like they are attacking the system. They are attacking it. But I think I'm trying to remember, um, they do have privileges that other communities don't have. I keep forgetting like the difference between an open and closed res and they're yeah. they're the they're the res that don't have a lot <clears throat> of restrictions toward like I'm getting I'm forgetting the name, but because they don't have um certain restrictions and they can do essentially what they want, um, not always, you know, because here in America they're able to make moves that can keep their their children in their community and not with other folks. And they have resources to help those parents, um, you know, get re-engaged with culture, with language, and also with their children, which I think is really dope. Hey, baby. Want to say hi? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Say, hello. Can you, can you see? <laughs> Got your hair all in your face. Can you see? <laughs> you show <it? laughs> That's his, his tooth fairy money. He's mm -hmm. like, listen, you gotta smile <laughs> if you know. I don't know. I don't know if he can hear me, but you gotta, you gotta slide it. Oh yeah. Oh, but oh, do you want to do the synopsis now for the next oh. one? Yes, 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 right, yes. We went yes, off yes. on a tangent. Sorry, we do this a lot, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> we don't apologize for who we are. <laughs> I don't have that book yet. Zombie sharks. No, I just, um, just crazy enough to just exit <laughs> out of it. Dang it. Hold on. I don't know why I did that. Just completely exited out of it. Okay, so it is zombie sharks with metal teeth, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm like, I don't want to mess up again. So I remember seeing a comment earlier of Evie saying that they read it, and I did see that you read it, but I have to skip your review. I don't want to be spoiled. Okay, so <laughs> here we are. Okay, so zombie sharks with metal teeth. If you've never been inside a giant space lobster, well, I don't recommend it. Mixing donuts and The Walking Dead proves to be a deadly combination in Stephen Graham Jones' latest novel, Z Zombie Bake Off, a, sl a slim volume of experiential fiction that wastes no time or word count on superfolius. I forget how you say that name detail or arbitrary introspective riffraff. Jones constructs a bare bones horror tale by combining clever, offbeat humor with a familiar yet unpredictable plot. That is really where he shines. Um, much like the mad but brilliant scientist in this collection tutelary story, Jones has created the tales here with experiential, exper experimental glee. Yielding, a, yielding an astonishing assortment of mutated manuscripts. The investigational, let's see what happens, mentality at play in this collection means that the story about gigantic soul soaring moon shrimp will also be told by a dime store PI. It means that elderly love and parenting are monster mash to deeper meaning. It means Gafka goes corporate in, in, uh, inspector. Basket hounds get sexy. Okay. And the aliens are popping up everywhere. It means you get your Raymond Carver via dog food therapy and the please let's get it just fucking die world of zombie <laughs> fiction gets repurposed twice in beautifully hard rendering ways. And yeah, there are hamsters. 
I would just say it. Jones went off the deep end at this time, but it's thrilling to watch an artist dive into their minds, Miranda's trench, and return with exploding or oceanic oddities. Cold train going from devilish smooth to full stellar stock. Apex twin going from ambient ambient pharmacist to robot brain masher. In here, Intep intrepid writer Stephen Graham Jones going from the assured human horror of early collection, the ones that got away, to the outstanding apparitions of zombie sharks with metal teeth. That was a lot. Yeah, and anyone in the chat, Bree, did we say that this was like a collection of stories? I don't think and we did, and I don't think I knew that until just now, but that's okay. Because it's yeah. written by this other person called, um, well, the introduction is from Jeremy Robert Johnson. So I think mm -hmm. it's short, and I like short collections personally. Um, so you know um yeah, exactly too. on brand me too me too i'd be in videos that i sit down and shoot and, and go on a tangent and we'll edit that tangent and include it in the video <laughs> <laughs> i need to get like a graphic that says get ready for the tangent and then get ready through. Get ready for the tangent. Or like a big, that big warning sign. Yeah. <laughs> I should like make it one of those things like our names are on the screen and be like incoming tangent and then go on it and then take it off when the tangent <laughs> is over. But yeah. All right. Um, what did those of y'all who read the book and the uh, comments what did you give it i know some people like jessica and lala also said you know y'all ratings just wanted to know if anybody else had anything they wanted to share about the book and just so people know um zombie sharks with metal teeth is also a short book I think it's like 161 yeah. pages. I have it in physical right copy and it's quite small. Right now we we said the, the live show will be in August. We have we don't have a date just yet, but we'll share it as soon as we're we're able to. Yeah. And then you're taking a break. When do we meet back? I already took the break. Uh, oh I mean, do we meet back again? in september or october november october october november october. okay yeah because i'll be horror themed <laughs> ready and i think the next book we're reading is a night cyclist right yeah after, after zombie sharks with my yeah yeah i haven't read that but that cover is so cool yeah, I mean, maybe we can add the night mannequins since uh, <laughs> already went full. Um, yeah, we could. We, so, we could add night of the mannequin. That book's pretty short. That's like yeah, thin, thin. It's like this one. It's thin, thin, thin. Yeah, I yeah, didn't even. Do that. Yeah, and this book, like the book we just read, was published in 2017, but the zombie book was published in 2013 so all right yeah, yeah. but That's thank cool. y'all don't seem like anybody is going to give us a rating yeah. but Everybody thank y'all for, for <laughs> rocking with us Appreciate yeah this you. is fun this is a fun one yeah and uh we'll talk to y'all next time Sometime in August, when one of us, both of us, put it on Beyonce's internet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, y'all. <laughs> bye. See you later.